السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today I'm gonna discuss in this presentation the anatomy of the breast and the axillary lymph nodes. I'm Dr. Dalia Saleh, professor and head of anatomy department at Mansoura University, Egypt. The objectives of the presentation will be First, I will talk about the breast regarding its development, its site and extension, its blood supply, and lymphatic drainage. Then the second half of the presentation will include the axillary lymph nodes. So I'm going to discuss the groups of axillary lymph nodes, their afferent connection, and their efferent connection. During the second month of gestation, two pans of thickened ectoderm appear on the ventral body wall extending from the axilla down to the groin. These two pans are called the milk lines and along these lines mammary gland tissue can develop. As we can see in this female dog, these are the two milk lines and you can see many uh, mammary glands develop along these two lines. In humans, only the pectoral portion of uh, these milk lines will persist and develop into the adult uh, mammary gland. However, if there is an excess nipple or breast, but along these milk lines, we call them supernumerary breast or supernumerary nipple. The mammary glands are ectodermal in origin because they arise from the cells of the epidermis, but they lie deep and embedded into the tissue of the dermis. So, the first appearance of the mammary glands by the thickening of the ectodermal cells of the epidermis, they will form what is called the mammary buds that penetrate the underlying mesenchymal cells of the dermis and give rise to several secondary buds which develop into lactiferous ducts and their branches. At first, they are not canalized, but later on, they get canalized during puberty. So remember that the mammary glands are ectodermal in origin because they develop from the cells of the epidermis, but they are deeply embedded in the tissue of the dermis and the superficial fascia of the ventral surface of the thoracic wall. So here we can see that the mammary buds that arise from the epidermis grow and penetrate the underlying mesenchyme of the dermis and give many secondary branches or budding. At first, they are not canalized, and later on, they get uh, canalized, and they open at the surface of the skin at a projection called the nipple. At first, it is inverted. By the time of birth, the nipple projects over the skin and become everted. Uh, so the mammary glands are modified sweat glands. They only become functioning. In lactating females they present in both sexes but of course more developed in females than males uh, they lie on the front or on the sides of the chest wall within the superficial fascia the small elevations here are called the nipples and they are surrounded by a colored circular area of skin called areola so the mammary gland plus the surrounding superficial fascia and skin are called the breasts so the breast is made of 15 to 25 loops. These loops are separated by fat and stripes of connective tissue. It's called the suspensory ligaments. And these are important ligaments to hold the shape of the breast. With age, these suspensory ligaments become weak. Thus, there is sagging of the breast in old women. Each loop has a duct called the lactiferous duct that open separately at the surface of the nipple. Behind the breast, there is a space filled with loose connective tissue. It's called the retromammary space. The breast extends from the second rib superiorly to the sixth rib inferiorly, from the edge of the sternum medially, till the mid-axillary line laterally. In males, the nipple is located in the fourth intercostal space at the mid-clavicular line. Of course, in female, because of the different sizes of the breast, we cannot locate the nipple accurately like that in males. Uh, the upper two-thirds of the breasts 
lies over the pectoralis major muscle and its overlying fascia, while its lower third lies over the serratus anterior muscle and the external oblique muscle and of course their overlying fascia. In 95% of the female, a small part of the breast tissue extends upward and laterally. We call it the axillary tail that pierces uh, the fascia at the lower border of the pectoralis major muscle and extends into the axilla. For the arterial supply of the breast, from the medial side, there is medial perforating branches that arise from the anterior intercostal branches of the internal thoracic artery, which arise from the first part of the subclavian artery. And the internal thoracic artery is the main blood supply of the breast. The second source of arterial supply to the breast is from branches from the axillary artery. It gives the supreme thoracic, the lateral thoracic, and the thoracoacromial artery, which gives a pectoral and mammary branches. The most important of uh, these three uh, are the branches that arise from the lateral thoracic artery. Also, the lower part of the breast is supplied by branches from the third, fourth, and fifth posterior intercostal arteries, which arise from the thoracic aorta. Regarding the venous drainage of the breast, the veins follow the same pattern as the arteries. So, we have veins that terminate into the internal thoracic vein, which eventually will terminate into the corresponding tracheospalic vein while uh, the veins that follow the lateral thoracic, acromiothoracic, and supreme thoracic arteries will empty into the axillary vein, which carry on at the outer border of the first rib and become the subclavian vein. At the lower uh, part of the breast, veins that follow the posterior intercostal arteries, these are the posterior intercostal veins, will terminate either on the azygous vein on the right side or the hemiazygous vein on the left side. Note that if there is breast cancer, cancer cells or metastasis can follow the first two pathways and reach the lung. From the last pathway or through the posterior intercostal veins and the azygous venous system, cancer cells can reach the skeleton and the central nervous system. For the lymphatic drainage of the breast, there are lymph vessels and lymph nodes. The lymph vessels form superficial plexus, can be seen under the areola, we call it sub areolar plexus, and also deep lymph vessels present in the uh, retromammary space, we call it the submammary plexus. These two plexuses communicate with each other with other lymph vessels. Here you can see the lymph vessels under the areola, we call it the sub areolar plexus, and deep to the breast in the submammary space, we call it the submammary plexus, and they communicate with each other with fine lymph vessels. Eventually, these lymph vessels will transmit lymph into lymph nodes. So, regarding the lymph nodes draining the breast tissue, we can simply divide the breast into four parts or four quadrants. Its lateral part, which represents about 75% of the uh, lymphatic drainage of the breast, will drain into the axillary lymph nodes, either the pectoral group, the subscapular group, or the apical group of lymph nodes. I'm going to mention them shortly. The medial part of the breast will drain into the parasternal lymph nodes along the sides of the sternum. The upper part of the breast will drain directly into the apical lymph nodes of the axilla, while the lower uh, part of the breast will drain into the rectus sheath and subdiaphragmatic lymph nodes. The axillary lymph nodes will eventually drain into the infraclavicular and supraclavicular lymph nodes. The second part of my presentation will be about the lymphatic drainage of the upper limb. We have superficial lymphatics and deep lymphatics. 
The superficial lymphatics arise from lymphatic plexus in the skin of the fingers, from the palm and dorsum of the hands. They ascend mostly with the superficial veins of the upper limb, pacelic on the medial side and cephalic on the lateral side. The lymphatics accompany the pacelic vein, will drain first at the cubital lymph nodes and then from there to the lateral axillary lymph nodes. Lymphatics that accompany the cephalic vein will drain into the deltopectoral lymph nodes or to the apical axillary lymph nodes. For the deep lymphatics of the upper limb, they are less numerous than the superficial vessels and they accompany the deep veins of the upper limb and they terminate into the humeral or lateral axillary lymph nodes. What about the axillary lymph nodes? First, let's talk a little bit about the axilla. It's the space that, that lies between the upper part of the humerus and the side of the chest wall. It's pyramidal in shape. It has four walls, an apex and a floor. The anterior wall here, the posterior wall, the medial wall, the lateral wall, the apex, and the floor. The axilla provides a passage for the arteries, nerves, and veins, and also lymphatics to and from the upper limb. In this sagittal section, we can see the walls of the axilla. This is the anterior wall, formed by three muscles, pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, subclavius and the clavipectoral fascia. The posterior wall here is made by the subscapularis muscle which lies on the ventral surface of the scapula. The lower border of the teres major and the desmus dorsi. Notice that the fascia of the pectoralis major muscle extends and communicates with the fascia over the latissimus dorsi and together they form what's called the suspensory ligament of the axilla. It's the one that is responsible for making the floor of the axilla hollow when you elevate your arm. Inside the axilla, you can see the axillary sheath containing the axillary artery and vein and the cords of the brachial plexus arranged around the axillary artery. So the axillary lymph nodes, they drain the upper limb, the upper abdominal wall, the pectoral region, most of the lymphatic drainage of the breast, and they are arranged in five groups. The anterior or pectoral group lies along the lateral thoracic vessels. Their afferent drain the pectoral region, the breast, and the upper abdominal wall. The posterior group of lymph nodes or the subscapular group, they lie along the subscapular vessels. Their afferents drain the back till the hip bone. The lateral or brachial axillary lymph nodes, they lie along the axillary vein and their afferents drain the upper limb. The central group of lymph nodes, they lie in the floor of the axilla between the previous three groups. They are the largest and most palpable one, and their afferents drain the anterior, posterior, and lateral groups of lymph nodes. The apical group of lymph nodes they lie at the apex of the axilla, immediately behind the clavicle, and they receive afferents from the other four groups, meaning the anterior, the posterior, the lateral, and the central group of lymph nodes, and also from the upper part of the breast and the skin of the upper limb along the cephalic vein. Eventually, the efferents uh, lymph vessels from the axillary lymph nodes will continue with the cervical lymph nodes and drain into either the right lymphatic duct on the right side of the body or 
the thoracic duct on the left side of the body. Both will terminate at the junction between the internal jugular and the subclavian vein. Thus, the lymphatic drainage returns back to the circulation. And this is the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. And if you like it, please do not forget to subscribe, like, and share.